Chancellor Freenia. In 2014, WNYC estimated 2,118 four-year-olds in my district, but we only had 123 pre-kindergarten seats, and I'm grateful that we've been able to add some 500 as of last year, but my parents and I shouldn't have to fight for every seat. How many four-year-olds have applied for pre-K on the Upper East Side and in my district? I do not have that specific information with me. Do you have that? Yes. Um, okay. I'm actually, can I have uh, Jessica Pavone from our uh, pre-K team speak? I, yeah. I just have to swear them in. Okay. So okay. would you raise your right hand and uh, state your name? Jessica Pavone. You solemnly swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and to answer council member questions honestly. I do. Okay. Hi, council member. Good morning. Um, so over last year's application for round one, we saw an uptick of about 153 students um, applying in the first round within. So, and, and what's that total number? The total number um, for, th for this year uh, is about 806 students who applied in the first round. And how many pre-K seats do I have in my district on the Upper East Side? So right now, for this year, you have 511 seats available. So we actually went down in the number of pre-K seats that we had versus last year. Um, no, I don't. I don't believe that that is the case. Um, so I can I can we, we verify can go over that those and get numbers, back. But to I guess the, the big question for the chancellor is: Does the DOE's promise, the mayor's promise of pre-K for all, apply to the Upper East Side? Council member, if I may, we we have been um, very appreciative of your support. Um, as you know, the Upper East Side is a challenging real estate it, environment. It is no more challenging than anywhere else, and uh, we've been trying mm -hmm. to work with you, but you. The DOE, and we'll get to that in a moment, has not really been uh, honest and forthright in working with us. So I have a, another question. How did the DOE prioritize the placement of the first 40,000 new pre-K seats, and why did less than 1% go to my district and the Upper East Side? Jessica, this is something that let me do a little bit more homework on because I did not come prepared to answer the specific question. But this is it's been this is my okay. fourth year of asking these All questions, right. and but so do we need to build more seats? Do we need to build more? I schools I think we in need to figure out a way to make sure that all students who apply have a seat. And I think also it's looking at where is there at least space? Where are there schools? I know some of the schools on the Upper East Side are taking pre-Ks for the first time that they didn't have in the past. So. And, and others are giving up their pre-K seats at the same time. Council member, uh, hear your concern, um, understanding that we're in a crunch this upcoming it, school it's, year. It's just that this is my fourth year of asking this question, and if the mayor, Deputy Mayor Glenn, SCA, or you had been responsive, multiple large buildings with hundreds of mm -hmm. units would now have the schools we need in them, and we would be done. Will you agree to direct SCA to meet with every developer of new construction in my district to see if they are interested in building schools for uh, for public school students. Yes, and I, I, my understanding is that SCA is currently doing that with developers in the, on the Upper East Side. SCA has, has said that there is no new need. We, we just had a, a previous budget hearing, and they said there is no new need on the Upper East Side for more schools. So I we, now have you on record saying so, so we can share that and with And I will SCA. confer with my colleagues at SCA. We are building, I have four additional classrooms coming in on the in the 2018 school year. Understanding that still is a crunch for this upcoming school year, but we are working diligently to find seats for uh, four-year-olds in your district and across all of the districts in the city. Um, and so, but we, we want to work with you to make sure that all four-year-olds have a seat. It is, it is pre-K for all, and we want to make sure that it's equitable for your district as well. And, and I do want the answer on why my district uh, didn't get the appropriate seats for the first four years. Thank you, Chair Drum. So just to uh, clarify and confirm, because I thought I got very good news, do you agree that there is a new seat need on the Upper East Side for the School Construction Authority? Yes, and we will see how we can meet it. Thank you very much. That is incredibly, incredibly good news. Uh, and so just to follow up on the uh, Chair's questions about uh, hunger, I have trouble focusing when I'm hungry uh, Chair, uh, uh, Chancellor, do you have trouble focusing and doing work when you're hungry? Since I never have lunch, I, I, I have a hard time trying to figure out when I'm hungry and when I'm not. But uh, <laughs> yes, I agree, but I want to be clear. So, no child in New York City doesn't get to eat lunch for any reason. They don't. And I understand your goals of universal free lunch, but I want to say that everyone gets to eat lunch. I, I, 
I was a public school kid who didn't eat lunch because I grew up on the east side and there was a stigma as being one of the kids who ate this free lunch and I see the look on your face and it was a bad decision that I made as a kid but it turns out that other kids make that same bad decision and then along the same lines we've seen an increase in participation. We have a federal government that wants to block grant any program there is and if we can increase participation at any level uh, we can uh, have a higher basis for the block grant that they will start cutting away at. So I, I just want to be clear that I don't totally disagree with you, but I do think lunch is an environmental issue as well. And one of the things I've asked Deputy Chancellor, what do we need to change about the environment at lunchtime that will get kids to want to eat lunch? And I'll give you an example. I went to visit a high school where almost none of the kids eat lunch, and they are entitled to it. So we are doing a major restructure of the, the lunchroom. We're changing what we're serving. We're getting the kids involved in making menu choices. So I think eating has a whole lot of other connotations because eating is a cultural thing I, as well. I, I agree so. with you and, and the schools in my district that have made those capital investments to the lunch program and to the area has, have been great, but I guess it's just at the last budget hearing you had indicated that the reimbursement rate for free lunch was over 80 cents on the dollar. Is that still the reimbursement rate that we'd be looking at? I don't have, I don't have that figure. If you can provide it, but I, I think we have a chance to make sure that every kid has breakfast in the classroom so that if they're late they can they can still eat and have lunch and then the, the next thing that I'll be asking you for once we get these two done is uh, snacks and supper because I want every kid to get their three square meals a day and not have to worry about where their next meal is coming from. Uh, would, would you agree to those goals? And I will say just really quickly on the after school programs because there are snacks provided in after school programs which is one of the items that are in uh, one of the cuts for the federal government. Uh, we should and, and work to have that conversation. If I, if I may ask one line of questioning just on the local law 14 and 15. Well, I don't know about a line, but a question. Hmm? Oh, I don't know about a line, but a Fair question. Uh, I, I was proud to be a co-primary sponsor on uh, health education re reporting requirements, local law 14 and 15. Heard from advocates like Planned Parenthood and others that 43% uh, of the eighth graders have not received health education before leaving middle school, that of those who are in educating it, there's 15,397 uh, instructors, but only 153 are licensed, and, and even worse, uh, just along the lines of uh, gender and sexuality, and talking to a middle school kids in my district, they actually ta told me that when they got their health education in seventh grade, uh, there was no education around the fact that uh, their gender identity uh, could be different than they were born with and that was okay. And that their sexual identity uh, might not be heterosexual and that was also okay. They're not getting that education even at the at, at grade schools like Eastside Middle School. So how can we make sure that every kid gets uh, health education under the state law and also uh, make sure that our public school system is welcoming folks regardless of, of gender identity or sexual identity? Yeah. No, I, I think that moving our middle schools in particular to have these conversations and who we train to have these conversations is certainly part of our agenda. Okay, thank you. And just as a follow-up to that, what success have you seen with the elementary school health education pilot program that you implemented? I think it depends on specific schools. Some schools have obviously taken it on more enthusiastically than others. Um, and I think it's also at what grade do you put it in. I think it's particularly successful in fifth grades across the city from what I'm hearing. Um, more spotty on other grades. Thank you. And I know we're going to look at this a little bit more in depth uh, down the road. 